I'm an outdoors type of guy. I love the crisp, clear air, the rustling sounds of the forest, the silent conversations trees seem to have when the wind blows. I could spend hours walking under the towering pines just for a chance to catch a glimpse of a rare bird or a deer grazing. You could probably guess that I would be the one to have an encounter in the woods with a creature that's hard to describe, hard to believe even. That's why I decided to write in. My story starts in Baxter State Park, Maine, an absolute gem of natural beauty hidden away up north, the perfect place for my solitary walks, where I often lose myself in the vastness of the forest and the grandeur of the mountain. Now, I don't expect everyone to understand why I spend my precious time in the middle of nowhere, usually alone. But to me, the solitude soothes and refreshes me. No flashing screens, no ringing phones, no hardcore bosses, just me and nature. So there I was, just another beautiful day in the park. I parked my Jeep, grabbed my backpack, and started my journey into the woods, bird watching, hiking, the occasional examination of interesting foliage. I had no particular itinerary planned that day. By the time the sun was directly overhead, I'd made my way to a small clearing that gave me a great view of the surrounding trees. I decided to settle down there for a while, to enjoy my lunch and observe an oddly active squirrel. The park was engulfed in a soothing calm. The air smelled of earth and greenery, but suddenly I felt a shift. It's hard to explain in words, but just like before a thunderstorm, when the heavy silence gives way to an electric tension, the atmospheric shift was tangible. My cheerful squirrel went silent. The birds ceased their singing. And there was this odd thickness to the air, as if the woods themselves were holding their breath. Then, a strange smell cut through the forest air. It was like sulfur. I chalked it up to be a geothermal occurrence, or maybe a decaying carcass nearby. But the timing of it was too odd to be a coincidence. Right when everything was going quiet, and then suddenly this smell appeared. There was definitely something going on here, even though I didn't want to admit it at the time. Shaking off the creeping unease, I packed my stuff and pushed on, deeper into the woods. I had no idea that I was walking straight towards a confrontation that would leave me questioning the very fabric of reality. I started to hear sounds, rustling leaves, dry branches cracking under pressure. Something was in the woods with me, something big from the sound of it, and the smell was stronger too, choking the fresh forest air. Uncertain what it was, I proceeded with caution, suspense building up with each hesitant step. That's when I first saw its shadow, a silhouette, tall and bizarrely shaped, with features that didn't seem to belong to any one animal. I could discern a large figure, the height of a bear maybe, but thinner. I held my breath, focusing on the source of the disturbance, and braced myself for an encounter with a hungry bear. But that isn't what stepped out into the clearing in front of me. The creature that stood before me was something that made me question my own eyes and even my sanity. It was tall, about nine feet high. The body seemed skeletal, like the exterior of an exoskeleton, but had a scaled skin texture. It looked like a strange amalgamation of different creatures. The head of a goat, or perhaps a deer, with the body of a lizard, and the wings of a bat. The creature had an exterior skull, giving it a demonic, terrifying appearance. Its eyes were like a strange goblin creature's, glowing yellow in the shade of the trees. A shiver ran down my spine as my eyes took in the bizarre sight. It was absurd, unbelievable. My rational mind cycled through possibilities, a trick of the light, a forest fire-induced hallucination. But the eerie smell of sulfur hung heavily in the air, like a dark perfume that underscored the monstrous reality standing before me. As the creature shifted, light cascading across its scaled skin, I realized this was no hallucination. It started to move toward me and I ran. I sprinted through the forest, my breath ragged. I didn't stop until I couldn't smell the strange sulfur stench anymore. When I finally stopped, panting and shaking, the forest returned to its usual chorus of pleasant sounds. I'd outrun the creature, if that was even possible. Or more likely, it decided not to chase me for whatever reason. Wrapping my mind around the encounter was another colossal task altogether. 
Could I go back to the park after that? Could I ever enjoy the solitude of nature again knowing such things existed? These were some of the questions flowing through my mind as I hastily packed my things and left. I wanted out. Out of the woods, out of the park. Back home, the encounter kept replaying in my head. But would anyone believe me if I told them I encountered this thing? Would they think I'm insane, delirious, or worse? Even now, as I write this to you, I question if what I saw was real or just a figment of my imagination. Was the smell just some previously unknown geothermal activity in the area? I don't have answers, but I do know that in my solitary walks, I'll be on guard now more than I've ever been. Not just against the mundane wildlife, but against the mythological as well. I'm writing to you from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to tell you about an escapade I had that was absolutely insane. It was mid-August 2012, just after my 32nd birthday. I found myself standing at the base of the hauntingly inviting Franconia Ridge. The New Hampshire sky was clear with low humidity. A perfect day for climbing, or so I thought. I get those adrenaline surges about climbing. The thrill of the challenge, the rush of risk, and the satisfaction of conquering a wall can't be compared to anything. For me, it's more than a simple pastime. It's an addiction. And that trail that day was just the tall glass of rock vodka that I craved. I love the sturdiness of the cliffs, the gravel crunching under my climbing boots, and the crisp mountain air. A good climb always reminded me how alive I was. With the firm grip on my rope and the pick in my hand, I started scaling that vertical, rough, and fantastic mountain. I was on my usual finesse, mastering every nook and crevice, pushing myself. As I strained upwards, meticulously avoiding the treacherous loose rocks, the last thing on my mind was running into anything. Peculiar. Obviously, you expect some bird nests, a drop of sap from a pine tree, or, at worst, an unexpected gust of wind. You don't expect a face-to-face -face encounter with the more insane aspects of the natural world. But sometimes, you don't always get what you expect, do you? In retrospect, a part of me feels like I sensed it before I even saw anything. A certain heaviness in the air, an inexplicable shift in the atmosphere. The normal chirping sounds of the mountain had faded to a deafening silence. The quiet was so profound that I could hear my heart thumping against my ribcage. Suddenly, there was a weird, almost nauseating smell that overcame the wind carrying pine and fresh earth smell. It was a mishmash of wet dog, a faint scent of skunk, and something that smelled awfully like weak old garbage. The odor was so overpowering, it made me nauseous. I clung to that rock surface, trying not to retch. Then I heard it, the sound, a low growling rumble that echoed through the silence. A sound so strange and intense it made the hairs on my nape stand up. Somewhere between an animal's howl and an eerie whooping noise that was far from any animal sound I'd ever heard. At this point, I wasn't just shocked or puzzled. I was downright terrified. It wasn't the fear of the immediate danger. It was the uncertainty that was freaking me out. I felt like a baby mouse being watched by an eagle circling miles above it. Invisible yet threatening. As I cautiously moved my eyes around, Searching for the source of the sound, I suddenly saw it, or at least I saw a part of it. Suffice it to say, my blood ran cold. Damn, I wish I could say it was just a bear, or even a rogue mountain lion. But it was neither. What I saw was giant. It was at least seven feet tall and burly. A linebacker figure about 100 feet off to my right, on a flat ledge of the mountain. It was covered in hair like a grizzly, but redder and shining under that midday sun. And the smell, that rancid, gag-inducing odor, was undoubtedly wafting from it. The creature's profile was distinctly Neanderthal-like, with a cone-shaped head jutting out a little further than its massive chest, and its eyes were these beady, shiny little things, like dark, polished stones. Its face, though, that was the kicker. It didn't have hair on its face like the rest of its body, and despite the distance, I could make out a pronounced strong brow ridge, bridged nose, and thick lips. What rang in my ears next was a loud yelp-like sound 
that echoed off the granite cliffs, followed by a deep, throaty growl. It was almost primal, a menacing auditory warning that told me to stay right where I was. Time seemed to slow. I clung there, a third of the way up this massive wall, staring wide-eyed at this strange, hulking creature on the ledge. To my surprise, it didn't move. It just emitted another noise, a low rumble, which in hindsight could have been a call or a warning, I don't know. Swallowing hard, realization hit me. There was only one creature with these descriptions, the elusive Sasquatch. Hovering between fascination and stark terror, I made a split-second decision. Instead of scrambling upwards, I decided to awkwardly crab walk my way horizontally across the massive rock face, putting some distance between me and the creature, hoping it wouldn't follow. Once I moved out of the creature's direct line of sight, I continued my climb at lightning speed. Every rustle of the wind, every bird's cry, seemed to amplify the fear coiling up in my gut. Even when I reached the top, my eyes darted back towards the ledge, but the Sasquatch, or whatever it was, had disappeared. Once I descended and safely got back to camp, I found everything as I had left it. No monstrous creature wreaking havoc or leaving gigantic footprints. I let out a shaky breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding. That night, I replayed the event over and over in my head. I wondered if what I'd seen was real or a fear-crafted illusion, but the hard claw of fear had paled in comparison to the exhilaration of journeying into the unknown and the astonishment of encountering a creature that storybooks and legends are made of, an actual Sasquatch. The belief that I had witnessed something rare and riveting had me eagerly wondering about the future. Climbing like the mountains offered a peculiar mix of brutal realism and dreamy escapism. And the experience just reminded me why I push myself to limits and scale mountains. It's not just for the thrill of standing atop a victory climb or for the adrenaline high that you feel at 4,000 feet. It's also for these chance encounters that weave themselves into lifetime experiences that are worth sharing. This happened a while ago when I went fishing on Lake Michigan. People hear the word lake and they think of calm waters and good weather. But the Great Lakes are different. They're huge. They're more like inland seas. And some of the wilderness areas around them can be rugged and unforgiving. As an avid fisherman, I spent a lot of time up there. My idea of relaxation involved my trusty fishing rod, a clear day, and, if I was lucky, a monstrous pike at the end of my line. That day started out perfect. Something about the hum of the water and the occasional screech of a gull was like music to my ears. Moreover, if there's one high in this world that tops them all, it's the thrill and suspense of that tug on the fishing line when you've got a big one biting. That's one irresistible high for me. I think just about every fisherman can agree with me there. I arrived at dawn, the eastern sky ablaze with red. I took my time as I pulled out my fishing gear and prepared my boat. Before the sun could even hint at its peak, I slid smoothly over the dark, glassy water. After a short while, I found the perfect spot, a quiet, calm patch of water just beyond the bay and out of the wind. I cast my line into the water with a satisfying plop and settled into the waiting game. It was a way to clear my mind and relax. I could spend countless hours out there with nothing but my thoughts and the rhythmic lapping of the water against the hull of the boat. With every minute that passed, I found myself sinking deeper into the silence, my mind relaxing with the waves. The world couldn't have been more perfect at that moment, but that isn't the reason I rode into your channel. There was also a stirring in the air that day. It started a few hours in, a sense of unease that seeped into my tranquility. That's when things took an unfamiliar turn. I heard a sudden and unsettling low growl. I looked around but couldn't locate the source. I wasn't particularly worried since such sounds were part of the usual soundscape. There are always critters about, and I wasn't too terribly far from shore. But then it happened again, and it was louder. I felt a sudden wave of cold air come off the water, and with it came a putrid smell of something obscenely rank. It wasn't fishy. I didn't think it was coming from the lake. It was a musty, dank smell, almost like rancid garbage. The hair on my neck stood up. 
My skin crawled as I turned around with a sense of overwhelming dread. I saw a fleeting silhouette right at the edge of the forest where it met the lake. It was just a silhouette, but it terrified me right to the core. The beast was tall, as tall as a man I would say. It was standing upright but hunched over at the shoulders. At first I thought it was a bear. Black bears are pretty common around the lakes, but then I saw its eyes, and I knew it was no bear. The eyes were yellow and glowing, and worst of all, they seemed fixated on me. If I didn't know better, I would say this thing had the head of a wolf, but there is just no way that could be. Things like that didn't exist. They couldn't exist. I was totally dumbstruck. As I sat there trying to wrap my head around what I was seeing, the figure disappeared into the trees. I reeled in my line, pulled up my anchor, and made my way back to shore. I didn't think the creature was about to swim out there after me, but I just couldn't relax again on the water after seeing it. As I neared the boat launch, I had to pass by a section of forest. I completely missed the thing at first, believing it was just a pile of brush or something. It was hunched over on the banks of the river, like a dark ball of hair. I didn't put the pieces together until it stood up. It was the creature I had seen a few moments ago, but at this close range, I could see it clearer. And what I saw was nothing short of extraordinary. Its body, stark against the morning sun, appeared covered in a thick, coarse fur. From a distance, it looked black, but the creature's hair was actually a very deep brown. It was muscular, a broad chest and powerful hind legs that looked like a mixture of human and canine. But those eyes, those were a sight that I'll never forget. They glowed like a yellow fire in the morning light. The fur that cloaked its body seemed to thin out at its face, revealing an elongated muzzle. It was even more wolf-like up close. I watched, frozen in sheer awe, forgetting any fear that gripped me. There was something almost mesmerizing about its beastly stature despite the overwhelming sense of dread. I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. I think I had caught the creature off guard, because as soon as it saw me, it took off sprinting into the tree line, and suddenly it was gone. Whatever the beast was, it seemed to want little to do with me, and for that I was grateful. The encounter hasn't kept me off the water, but I do make a point to watch my surroundings. I don't mindlessly drift off into my thoughts anymore. I keep an eye out for things unknown and undiscovered, and if you spend any time out there in the wilderness, you should too. I have an unusual tale to share with you. I love the outdoors. I love to hike and backpack. I've run into quite a few species of wildlife over the years, and occasionally, an odd person or two. But what happened on this day, well, it's something else entirely. In fact, I'm still not quite sure what to think about it. It happened last June, and I haven't talked about it since. I'm a high school science teacher, and so I have my summers off. That summer, I was on a solo two-week backpacking trip through the Cascades. It's an area I've frequented for years. I try to get out there as much as possible. I had taken a different trail than normal that time. No reason in particular for my deviation. I guess I was just looking to explore new areas. A couple of days in, and I found this old, abandoned campsite. There aren't many campsites this far out. Most people ascribe to the leave no trace principles. So, to find somebody's campsite is pretty darn unusual. There were a few things strewn about. An old pot rusting next to a stone circle that had once served as a campfire an aged and faded canvas tent collapsed on one side and a moldy backpack. I spent some time looking around the area. It didn't make sense for hikers to leave their tent and backpack behind. I was getting worried that I might have stumbled upon the last known whereabouts of a missing camper. Curiosity got the better of me, and I started rummaging around the site. The tent was old, like those canvas things that people used before you could buy an ultra-lightweight space-saving, self-pitching style at the local sports retailer. That gnarly thing looked like it could stand up to a hurricane. Bearing my weight on it, I propped it up, and a cloud of dust kicked up from the ordeal, which made me curse and wave my hat around in a desperate bid for fresh air. The rucksack was downright fascinating. Inside it, I found a bag of what used to be trail mix now taken over by some sort of small critter. 
All at once, just as the sun was hitting its peak, I felt this odd feeling. It was hard to explain, almost as if someone or something was watching me. Now, I've spent enough time hiking to know that sometimes you're not alone in the wilderness. It could be animals or other hikers, but this felt different. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. It was a sensation I'd not felt in a long time. Bear in mind, I hadn't seen or heard a soul for days, which was no surprise out here. The wilderness does frequently remind you just how tiny your piece of existence is. But there was something terribly wrong here, and it wasn't just that abandoned campsite. And then, out of nowhere, I heard a sound that I'll never forget. It was a deep huff, followed by a low, resonating growl. It echoed through the trees, making the leaves rustle, and birds flutter away in fright. At first, I thought it was a bear, and I can tell you for certain that I wouldn't want to encounter a bear so close on a trail. But as I would soon find out, there are creatures more terrifying than bears out there in the wild. Suddenly, the earth vibrated beneath me, like I was standing next to a large stampeding animal. Turning on my heels, I stepped backward in shock as the colossal figure burst into view. Its towering form shadowed the clearing in its wake. It had to be near about nine feet tall. Its body was robust. I could see the thick, coarse hair covering its entire form, except for the face and hands. The hair was a shimmering reddish hue as the sun's rays hit it. I'm a big man myself, but this creature made me look pitifully small. And boy, the smell. A rancid, putrid odor crept over me, thick and heavy. It was its face that really got my heart pounding, though. Broad cheekbones warped into a bulging forehead, leading to deep-set eyes that were as dark as midnight. Its wide nostrils flared, repeating that unsettling huffing sound. It was like a mix between a man and an ape, like some sort of missing link of human evolution, but much, much larger. It bared its teeth at me. I don't know if it was simply showing its strength or if it was a direct threat. Shaking from the sight, I found myself instinctively crawling back toward my camp gear. My safely propped up tent now looked like a flimsy sanctuary in the face of this hulking beast. The growl repeated, louder this time, rolling through the campsite like a thundercrack and making me stumble over the worn tent ropes as I backed away. With a loud snarl, it took a step forward. For all its heft, the creature was surprisingly agile. I didn't stick around to marvel at its next move. Gathering my wits about me, I bolted. Through the thick underbrush, past old oaks, I ran until my lungs burned, and then I ran some more. I was finally under the cautious safety of a new hidden camping spot, but I still spent the night wide awake. I don't know how I managed to evade that creature, but somehow I did. And I can tell you though that I never went back there. I'm not sure what happened to the people from that abandoned campsite, but I don't imagine anything good came to them if they met that creature like I did. The encounter left a profound impact on me, leaving me questioning my brave solo hiking trips. I can't settle in the wilderness the way I used to before I knew of the creature's existence. This isn't a story I wanted to share, but I think people need to know that there are real, live monsters out there. And if you are heading out to enjoy some solitude in the wilderness, you had better be careful and be prepared for anything. I want to tell you a little about my encounter with a true anomaly that left me completely dumbfounded. This one happened at Big Bend National Park, one of my favorite places to get away when I need to escape the noise of the world. Big Bend is like nothing else you've ever seen. Mountains, deserts, rivers, canyons. It's got everything. To me, it feels like another planet, so isolated and tranquil. Anyhow, I was driving down from Fort Stockton, and I rock up to the park entrance pay my fee, and head in. It was a little late in the day. The sun was setting, casting spectacular hues of orange, pink, and purple across the peaks and valleys. I had my camping gear and a week's worth of provisions in my truck, and I'd planned to rough it out in those desert flats, reconnect with myself, and enjoy the solitude. I remember it was the start of June, and the desert was in full bloom with cactuses flaunting their radiant flowers. The first day was uneventful. I set up my camp near the base of one of those monolithic rocks. 
took an easy trail and reveled in the emptiness around me. On the second day, I took a longer trail up into the mountains. It was on the third day in the park that this encounter took place. I had planned to visit Santa Elena Canyon that day. Like all my mornings at Big Ben, I woke up early with the sun, fortified myself with a strong cup of coffee, packed up and headed out. Once I reached the canyon, I rented a kayak and drifted down the Rio Grande. After a few hours of uninterrupted paddling, I halted my journey to snack and hydrate alongside the riverbank. That's when I noticed it. There was something in my peripheral vision, an oddity against the backdrop of the natural landscape of the park. At first, I brushed it off as a trick of the light. The desert sun can mess with your eyes. But the object remained, moving amid the desert plants. It wasn't like anything I'd seen before. It felt out of place, not something I'd expect to see on a typical day at Big Bend. I noticed then that I hadn't heard anything in a while. No insects, no birds, no wind, nothing. Now, if you've never been in a desert, it's hard to describe how quiet it can be. But this was different. It wasn't natural. Before I even had a chance to process it, this humming sound filled the air. It wasn't loud, but it was certainly there, deep and rumbling. At first, I thought it was a bug or maybe some desert creature I wasn't familiar with. But as I looked up, the sight confirmed that I was wrong. Rising into the air, illuminated by the setting sun, was a craft of some kind. It was probably about 15, maybe 20 feet wide and just hovered there in the air with no apparent means of propulsion. It was saucer-shaped, like out of a 50s movie. The body of the craft was a sort of metallic silver color and appeared to have a slight illumination around the edges. I don't know if I'd say it was a glow, but there was something in the air around it. Maybe it was some type of electrical field. I don't know. Red and blue lights of some sort circled the edge, spinning in a sequence too complex for me to follow. It was a sight to behold and completely terrifying in its otherworldliness. I felt a tingling sensation running up my spine now, either fear or awe, possibly both. I was glued to the spot, jaw hanging open as this object defied every rule of aerodynamics I knew of. It didn't make any sense. One moment, it had hovered stationary as though affixed in the sky, and the next, it had moved swiftly yet seamlessly changing direction without easing its speed. The eeriest part, though, was the sound. It was a low hum, mechanical in nature, but too rhythmic to be random noise. Then, as quickly as it appeared, it vanished, zipping off into the horizon faster than anything I'd ever seen, leaving only the echo of its hum behind. I stood there for a moment longer, dumbfounded. The silence of the desert soon returned, but this time it was different. The quiet didn't feel peaceful. It felt heavy laden with a million unspoken words and unanswerable questions. In the days that followed, I tried to come to terms with what I'd seen. I'd never been one to believe in UFOs or little green men, but here I was, rethinking my skepticism. After a few futile attempts to convince some other campers about my encounter and seeing their amused, disbelieving faces, I stopped. I knew what I saw, even if no one else did. My journey ended but the awe and question stayed with me. Every time I look up to the sky now, I'm left wondering what may be out there. Unknown. Unexplored. I still visit Big Ben, not just for its earthly beauty, but for the possibility of another close encounter. I want to know what's out there. From the onset, I really loved Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. I began my park ranger service there in the spring of 2018. Picture vast green meadows, densely wooded forests, and the sweeping faces of grizzled cliffs. It was the kind of place that had an allure of mystery and wonder that always made me feel like I was living in one of those historical novels I'd spend hours reading when I wasn't on patrol. Being a park ranger, there was more than just a job to me. It was a passion that stemmed from an intense love for nature. I've always loved the wilderness, camping and trekking through national parks since my childhood days. I always figured caretaking for one would be the best way to preserve the kind of places I'd spend my autumns, springs and summers exploring. 
On that particular day in early November, it was mild and calm. The sun was just starting to set, which painted the sky in striking hues of orange and pink. It was one of those scenes which, if you didn't pause to admire, you'd regret missing. My usual routine revolved around patrolling the trails, helping out tourists with directions, and on rare occasions dealing with any disturbances. Beyond that, a significant part of my duties lay in conserving the flora and fauna of the park. That day, my plan was to pay a visit to an area that had been reported for some possible weather erosion. As the evening grew darker, I hopped in my trusty old Ford Ranger, set the radio to the nearest weather station, and set off on the winding dirt road towards the site. It was a pretty typical night. The park, generally quiet, was not showing any signs of troubling activity. The tourists had gradually thinned out as darkness fell, leaving the park almost eerily silent. All you could really hear was the occasional croaking of a night frog or the rustle of small nocturnal critters in the underbrush. As I drove deeper into the park, the gravel crunching under the tires of my truck, I couldn't help but get absorbed in my own thoughts. Little did I know then that tranquility was about to take a chilling turn. Suddenly, the familiar sound of the dirt crunching under the tread of my truck was replaced with an odd, softer, squelching noise. I brought the pickup to a halt and grabbed my flashlight, stepping out onto the road to take a look at what I'd just driven through. The smooth wash of my headlights barely reached the edge of the road, but with the added spotlight from my flashlight, I saw a series of huge footprints matted deeply into the dirt. Something big had lumbered through here recently, and I'd driven over its tracks, leaving an ugly skid right through the middle. I evaluated the depth and size of the prints in the dim light, figuring maybe a bear had wandered too close to the tourist paths. Just as I was about to return to the cab, something caught my ear. An almost human-like grunt echoed across the trees, drowning out the nocturnal symphony around me. It was then that the hairs at the back of my neck stiffened. That was no bear sound. I radioed in, my thumb pressing hard against the talk button, as if it could keep my heart from pounding its way out of my chest. Stashing the radio back onto my belt, I thought it best to try to identify the source of the noise. I felt this primal fear creeping its way up my spine, but as a ranger, I knew I had a responsibility to investigate, especially if this thing was potentially a threat to any late night wanderers. The echo had come from the direction of Spruce Tree House, one of the historical landmarks of the park. As I cautiously made my way down the trail, the smell hit me. It started as just a hint of something stale, moldy almost, and evolved into a putrid odor that wrought images of rot and decay. The beam of my flashlight illuminated the narrow trail and stopped at the base of a colossal, hulking figure that turned and glanced back curiously. The light caught on the glossy brownish-red fur of the creature and drew a giant outline against the darkness. Paralyzed with awe and fear, I caught my breath, the beam flickering across a face that held more expression and humanoid features than any animal I've encountered. Set deep inside its large head were dark piercing eyes, a prominent heavy jaw, and chiseled cheekbones that were covered in that hair. The creature was massive, easily over eight feet tall with a bulk that suggested immense strength. My mind wrestled with primal fear and dumbfounded awe. Part of me screamed to run, to retreat and call for backup. The other half wrestled with the acknowledgement of coming across such a rare entity. This was a Sasquatch, I knew that much. With a loud, guttural growl, the creature turned toward me. I think it wanted me to leave. That was a notion I had no trouble accepting. Adrenaline took over then, and I turned on my heel, sprinting towards the direction of my truck. What occurred next, I could barely remember. It was a blur. The dash back felt like minutes instead of seconds. Through it all, I felt oddly grateful. My knowledge of the park and the survival skills it had conditioned me with had been a saving grace. When daylight greeted Mesa Verde, I was back at the ranger station, silent in my relief, reflection, and utter exhaustion. The park had changed overnight for me. The place I had admired for its serene environment was now tinged with a sense of fear and the unnatural. But was it unnatural? Or merely 
I had stumbled upon a truth that was hidden within the woods. I now knew that even amidst the calm meadows and cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde, unseen mysteries roamed, and it is these encounters that reminded us, humans, of what a small place we occupy among the vast wilderness. Sometimes strange things happen in the most mundane situations. I'm a plumber by trade, but also an avid outdoorsman. This strange episode of mine happened last summer. I'd taken a week off from the usual leaks and clogs of life to travel out west a bit. I decided to visit Bryce Canyon National Park. I'd heard a lot about it, but had never been there before. The moment I got there, I was entranced by those red rock formations and surreal alien landscapes. I was ready for some refreshing outdoor adventures, but it seems fate had another thing in mind for me that day. I decided to hike on the Navajo Loop and Queen's Garden Trail when I got there. It was argued to be one of the best ways to see Bryce. It supposedly featured a tour of the more dramatic hoodoos, the passages through the canyon walls, and the natural amphitheater that truly brings out the magic hidden within the canyon. Plus, there was a place named Wall Street, and that one made me chuckle a bit. Just the kind of humor Mother Nature has. That's where things got a little strange. As I descended into Wall Street, the rays of the sun weren't as unforgiving. Towering rocks shielded me and made the air cooler. The echo of my footsteps just bounced off the walls. The tall, narrow walls of the canyon created a sort of eerie ambience. It felt like being on a totally different planet. And then, out of nowhere, I heard a low, growl-like sound resonating off the stone walls. It sounded like it could have been a ways off, but the echo made it tough to tell. My first thought was, great, I'm about to meet a bear. I paused and surveyed my surroundings, seeing nothing but the towering rocks and the shadows they cast on the canyon floor. Moisture clung to the cool walls of the gorge, and a smell started to permeate the air. I can only liken it to the scent of damp fur a rather pungent odor like a wet dog that's been out in a swamp all day. A smell that felt out of place within the arid, sun-soaked formations of Bryce. I dismissed it as the musk of some local wildlife, and that was that, or so I thought. As the day moved on, the shadows in the DCA areas of the trail started getting longer. I brushed off my unease as a mere psychological trick nature was playing on me, and yet, I couldn't shake the sensation I had of being watched, even followed. But being an avid hiker, I knew Mother Nature was not all majestic views and peaceful environments. That smell of wet fur and rotting garbage grew even stronger. It seemed to follow me along my path, and that eerie feeling of being watched just wouldn't go away either. The hair at the back of my neck pricked up harder than before, and the strange growling, now a weird combination of low grunts and occasional whooping noises, continued echoing through the canyon. I knew something was wrong, but where was I supposed to go? I couldn't pinpoint the location of the vocalizations. I could either keep moving forward or go back. I chose to keep walking. Not a moment later, I saw movement further up the trail. Swiveling around, I squinted my eyes over the path. The dense shadow of the towering hoodoos made it almost impossible to discern anything. Against my better judgment, I decided to follow the creature. As I stepped gingerly over the rocky path, my heart pounded in my chest. Suddenly, a large form materialized from the shadowy depths of the canyon. When I say large, I mean huge, at least nine or ten feet tall. It was covered from head to toe in thick, shaggy hair. The hair was an odd mix of reddish and light brown almost making the creature blend right in with the background. I know how this is going to sound, but the creature was literally some sort of bipedal ape. It moved with surprising grace, despite its hulking body. In shock, I let out an involuntary gasp, my flashlight's beam trembling before it landed on its face. The light revealed an uncannily human-like face. Its head was somewhat cone-shaped with a sturdy brow ridge. A pair of beady black eyes glared back at me. The face itself was fascinating. At least to me, it had an almost primitive Neanderthal look to it. It was like I was looking at some missing link in the evolution of man. I stood there frozen, watching the creature watch me. Then, it suddenly let out a loud, yelping growl. 
I swear I'd never heard anything like that before. I guess it could have been fear or nerves or both, but I had the sudden instinct to turn tail and run. Judging by the creature's noises, I don't think it wanted me there. So I did just that. I ran. I sprinted as fast as I could all the way back to the parking lot. Finally reaching my car, I slammed the door shut and took off. The next day, I returned to the trail, half expecting it to have been nothing more than a nightmarish figment of my imagination. But when I saw the disturbed foliage and now dried, large, unrecognizable footprints imprinted in the damp earth of yesterday's trail, I knew better. Call it what you will. Sasquatch, Bigfoot, or perhaps some unidentified species of desert ape. Whatever its true identity, I know now that there are mysteries in the wilderness that we might not ever find answers to. I was always skeptical of these types of tall tales until it happened to me. Whether you believe me or not, you better be prepared for anything if you set food into the wild. It's their territory, not ours. And we do best to remember that. Hey Donovan, I just got into your show, and boy do I have a story for you. I've been a government contractor for 30 years now. Mostly mundane stuff, roads, bridges, that kind of thing. But a few years back, I got put on a slightly different job. It was in a research facility up in the Sierra Nevadas. Big place, armed guards, the whole nine yards. I never figured out exactly what they did there. All high-level stuff, classified, you know the drill. I wasn't there to ask questions anyway. I was there to replace some old pipes in the lower levels. All I had to do was my job and keep my nose clean. Let me tell you, I'm no stranger to working in creepy places. But this, this was something else. I had a badge, granted, but it didn't exactly open a lot of doors. Most of my work was underground, in the guts of the facility. I'd spend most of my day in tunnels lined with more pipes and cables than you can shake a stick at. Now, I started having this weird feeling right from the start. There was this constant, low rumbling, like a garbage truck idling in the distance. I figured it was just the generators or whatever. But then, in my second week there, things started to get really spooky. It was a regular Tuesday, nothing special on the docket, just the usual pipe replacements. Down in the maze, you're surrounded by a ton of background noise, right? Vibrating pipes, chunky old HVAC units, dripping condensation. You kind of get used to it after a while. On this day, however, something was off. Deep in the heart of the labyrinth, I could hear an eerie, watery echo. A thump. It was strangely methodical. Like a gutter filling and emptying in a storm. It was unsettling. It made all my instincts scream danger into my ear. Yet, I convinced myself it was just another wonky pipe making all that noise and the smell. Ah well, the stench was dreadful too. Like spoiled meat left in a plastic bag. Mixed with what smelled like wet dog and a burning rubber sort of smell. I sure did have my reservations, but you don't usually get to talk back in my line of work. So I did what I always do. I pushed on. I followed the source of the sound, shouldering past bundles of cable, climbing over thick slices of reinforced concrete, this facility was like a rabbit warren, twisting and turning in all directions. And then, suddenly, it ended. There was this sealed, unmarked door. And being a naturally curious guy, and also the one who wasn't exactly keen on ignoring this mysterious clanging sound, I needed to check what's behind it. I pulled out my master key card. Now, remember Donovan, I'm just a plumber. But I've been working with these government guys long enough to know that most of the time, Access is all about status, and there are few things in this world that can't be overridden by a little hard work and some networking. Ah, screw it. I nervously swiped the card. The green light flickered. The door beeped and opened. And, well, it's like walking into a nightmare, you know. I was suddenly standing on the threshold of a monstrous pit, all steel and concrete, and right in the center was a cage. Not really a cage, more like a containment cell. I'll admit it, Donovan, I was scared. It was the kind of tight, gnawing fear that folds you up small and just leaves you there. I had worked in this facility for weeks, thinking of it as just another job. Now it felt like, 
like a horror story. That's when I saw it. I'm a big guy Donovan, easily scrimmaging around 200 pounds. But the creature I saw in that cell would have towered over me even if it was crouched. It was huge, maybe seven, eight feet. It was difficult to tell, particularly when you're scared. The thing was, it was standing upright, not like a bear, but more human-like, all hunched and bulky with it. It was dark in there. The lighting inside the cell was barely functional, flicking on and off. Yet, I managed a glimpse of it. Its body looked like a perfect mix of hyena and man, long snout, demonic-looking face, and earthy, musky, dark brown fur covering it. The strength it exuded was obvious. A big chest, wide shoulders, just impeccably terrifying. And the sound it made, like a guttural growl, but low, very, very low. Panicked, I punched a button, and the door came slipping shut. I stumbled backward, tripping over my gear, trying to put as much distance between me and that, that thing as possible. I didn't go back to work after that day. I didn't even collect my stuff. I didn't say goodbye to anyone. I just left. I left the creature, the dog man, behind me in that pit of hell. Probably they wondered what happened to that contractor who suddenly vanished one day. But the memory of that chilling encounter stayed with me every single night. I thought about reporting it to authorities, but who would have believed me? Yeah, I met a werewolf in a government facility. You guys should look into it. That story might make for a great movie, but to me, it is a grim reality. Faced with the fact that such a creature exists and that our government is covering up its existence made me feel incredibly small in a world I thought I understood. So Donovan, that's why I decided I should share this on your show. I don't know the truth about that creature, whether it was a test subject or something found in the wild. All I know is that it felt like a dark secret that we all have a right to know. Who knows how many of such creatures are lurking around captive in secret spots, away from human reach, controlled for God knows what purposes. The truth is, we don't exactly know what's out there, but it's time we find out. It's time we know the truth. That's my story, Donovan. Do with it what you will. Driving a taxi around New Orleans at night is kind of like being in a waking dream. There's something eerie about the city. It's so vibrant, bustling, loud, and yet mysterious. And that wave of mystery only deepens after dark. There's a lot of history in this city, and sometimes it just so happens to seep out after sundown. I've been a cabbie here for about six years, and I've definitely seen my fair share of oddities. Most nights, my shift starts gracefully. The city, heavy with the setting sun, settles into a kind of quietness that's only found in the deep corners of the night. Now, I'll be honest, when I first started driving the night shift, I wasn't sure what to expect. But from the moment my tires kissed the streets, something clicked. It felt like home, a hidden world made just for me and all the nocturnal wanderers. Before I get into any business of shadows or ghostly figures, Let's talk about New Orleans neighborhoods. There are so many to explore, each with its distinct character and ambiance. The French Quarter, with its lively pubs and tourist-filled streets. Treme, laden with the culture of the Deep South. The Garden District, adorned with historic mansions cloaked in moss-draped oaks. You get to appreciate them differently after dark. They each have their own personality, and you get to know it pretty well as a late-night driver. Anyhow, it was on one of these usual nights when I was floating through the maze of roads, just doing my job. The last customer of the evening was just some random tourist, slightly tipsy, and trying to interpret the city's energy. He stumbled out of my car somewhere near Bourbon Street and disappeared into the mysterious embrace of the rolling fog. Normal stuff for me. It was right around 2 in the morning and the city seemed to take a breath. The neighborhoods were getting quiet and empty. I was moving hazily through the garden district, the large oaks forming a ghostly canopy above me. Just as I was about to call it a night, my attention was drawn to a silvery figure on the side of the road. There was nothing really distinctive about her, just another passenger. But there was something, maybe a shimmer around her, or the way the streetlight refracted through her. 
that made me feel a curious sensation of disquiet. She lifted her hand and gestured for me to stop. And, well, a ride is a ride, especially on a slow night. I pulled over, sliding to halt right alongside her. She climbed into the back seat. There was something odd about her. Her skin was almost glowing, and I don't mean that she had nice skin. I mean there was a glow, like a glowing light emanating from her. She was pale as fog, with hollow eyes that seemed to hold the secrets of centuries. Her destination, she said, just drive. I didn't know quite how to respond, so I did what she asked. I drove. Soon after we started our journey, the electric systems of the taxi seemed to go haywire. The radio dial spun wildly on its own. I couldn't help but steal glances of her through my rearview mirror. Her skin still seemed to have that faint glow. I hadn't been imagining it, but there was something else too. There was a chill in the air that overtook me as soon as she entered the cab. I was beginning to think I had picked up a ghost. Throughout the ride, whispers echoed around, faint and unintelligible, but undoubtedly there, just at the very edge of hearing. I couldn't tell if they came from her, or perhaps there was something else here, unseen, accompanying the strange woman. After what seemed like an eternity, the woman asked me to stop in front of a grand old mansion. It looked as though time had forgotten it. I turned my eyes towards the meter. Each tick felt like a heartbeat in the eerie silence. As I announced the fare and waited for my payment, I stole another glance back. Only this time, the back seat was emptier than a ghost town. I rubbed my eyes, thinking maybe the fatigue of the night was casting shadows. But no matter how much I wished it was all just a hallucination, I knew I didn't just drive there on my own accord. I looked back at the mansion. It was a mere shadow of its former grandeur, and in the cool light of the moon, it seemed to have disappeared, much like my ghostly fare. The faint echo of the whispers still hung about the car, a chilling reminder of the spectral journey. But as suddenly and ghostly they had arisen, they disappeared into the ether, leaving no hint of their presence either. I sat for a moment, frozen in my disbelief, my heart pounding like a war drum in my chest. I drove off striving to shake off the experience as if it were a bad dream, yet somehow knowing deep in my bones it was all too real. The night in the city had changed for me. Each shadow cast in the corners looked like a lurking phantom. Each light appeared as an otherworldly glow. The same streets I knew like the back of my hand were shrouded in a mysteriously spectral veil. I was, and still am, equal parts spooked and fascinated. After all, how many can claim to have given a ghost a taxi ride? While the encounter was unsettling, the ghostly woman didn't have any ill will towards me. She didn't try to scare me or harm me in any way. She merely wanted a taxi ride and that's fine by me. I've had worse customers than her. Savannah has always fascinated me. It's one of the oldest cities in Georgia. The place is steeped in history, and history always comes with its own stories which I love. That's why I was there one weekend back in 2019, visiting a buddy of mine. His name's Marty. We got to talking about these haunted tales people like to tell. Stories of local hauntings have always been prevalent here. I was skeptical at first, but thought it could be a fun way to spend a Saturday night. So, there we were, signed up for a ghost tour that covered a good bit of the historic district. Those old colonial houses and grand squares are a sight to see, even if you don't believe in ghosts. But, at nighttime, with just the lamp posts and the tour guide's flashlight for illumination, it's an entirely different ballgame. The soft street lamp glow gave the city an eerie feel, with shadows seeming to lurk around every corner. Our guide was a big, burly guy with the deepest voice I ever heard. He was incredibly knowledgeable, and his way of storytelling was genuinely spine-chilling. We started off around Monterey Square, the famous Mercer House looming ahead. The guide took us down shady lanes, narrating heartbreaking tales of lost loves, vengeful spirits, and mysterious disappearances. Each house we passed was seemingly more haunted than the last. Despite my skepticism, I was deeply engrossed in the stories, each one evoking a mix of melancholy and intrigue. Marty was cracking jokes for the first half, 
but I could see him growing quieter as the tour went on. I suppose the tales can affect even the most skeptical among us. We visited a couple of places on the list. The Colonial Cemetery, the Sorrel Weed House, the Eerie Hanging Square, each with a tale more chilling than the last. By then, even I felt uneasy, attributing it to the power of suggestion and our surroundings. About an hour and a half into the tour, we entered Calhoun Square. Now Calhoun is known as Savannah's most haunted square. There's an anonymous burial ground at its center, and it's surrounded by some of the city's most notorious haunted houses. Our guide shared that people often report feeling cold spots, see strange lights, and hear whispers in and around the square after dark. We moved on, and I couldn't help but notice a peculiar chill in the air that hadn't been there before. It was undeniably eerie. We then stood before a particularly dilapidated house. As the guide started on his next narrative, I felt a tug at my jacket sleeve. Figuring it was Marty, I turned around to tell him to quit it. But he was on my other side, his hands buried deep in his jacket pockets. Blinking back confusion, I glanced down and saw the dull glint of an antique-looking locket at my feet. As I bent down to pick it up, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I instantly knew it wasn't Marty or anyone else from our group. The touch was too cold, almost unnaturally so, and it made me shiver and gasp. Everybody turned their gaze towards me, including Marty and the guide. Their eyes locked onto something behind me. I turned around and came face to face with a woman, or rather, the figure of one. It was a translucent figure with a kind of otherworldly glow about her, looking profoundly sad. I heard whispers all around me, and panic started to set in with the group. Shockingly, there were chains wrapped around her wrist, with matted black hair reaching up to her shoulders. The whispering around me grew more insistent, and among the murmurs, I caught a name. Amelia. My heart pounded in my chest as I stumbled back. The figure just stared at me for a moment longer, before disappearing into the night air. The hand on my shoulder disappeared with it. With a dry mouth, I forced myself to swallow and looked up at our tour guide. His face was a shade paler than before, and his eyes wide. A prickling sensation swept over me in the chilly air, a response I couldn't control. After a few gulps of cold savanna air, I found my composure and held the locket up to the guide's lantern. Inside was a faded sketch of a young woman. Underneath the face was a single word, barely visible but still legible. Amelia. The rest of the tour passed quickly, everything blurring together as I could barely concentrate. And I think the guy just wanted to distract us. Marty, pale and quiet, tried to lighten the atmosphere with a few forced jokes, but even he felt the shift in our surroundings. The rest of the night passed with an unspoken agreement to not discuss the earlier events. I spent that night researching Amelia, and what I found was incredibly unsettling. A young woman named Amelia, reported missing in 1886, was one of Savannah's most haunting stories. Her disappearance had remained a mystery, and some believe that she still roams the city. Holding the locket now, it was becoming less a mystery for me, and more of a first-hand encounter. Savannah, it turned out, still carried its past around in more ways than meets the eye. I questioned my own skeptic notions, questioned what I knew, or rather what I didn't know. In my hand was a piece of Savannah's eerie history, a direct link to stories between this world and whatever might lie beyond. 